Good afternoon, everyone. I wanted to invite you to part five of our, um, I guess I would, I would say our, it's a progression slide presentation uh, with Ralph Preston in regards to what you can do, how you can take charge of your, your own rehab after rehab is done and how you can continue with it. Um, and I'm so excited again to introduce you to Ralph. Hey, Ralph, how are you? I'm doing great, Samantha. Thank you. I appreciate you guys having me and the opportunity to present this. Um, yeah, uh, a lot of people end up getting sent home from uh, rehab after their insurance runs out. And some people aren't fortunate enough to have insurance in the first place. So this can either be for the people that are starting from scratch or the people that get sent home when their insurance runs out. I never use the word if, I always use the word when, because it will. Um, so go ahead to the next one. Once again, here's my little disclaimer. I'll do it as fast as I can. I'm not a physical therapist, or in this case, an occupational therapist. There's nothing here that's really very strange or dangerous or harmful or anything. These are all things that I did, and they're things that other therapists uh, recommend. If you check with them, there won't be anything particularly strange here. So next. Okay, so some of the things we're going to talk about today obviously open it because one of the things that's a real problem with hands is um, people end up <clears throat> with a closed fist and they can't open their hand. That's one of the um, big um, challenges to getting your hand moving. Uh, and in that light, one of the things you can do is move it with your other hand. We'll get into all these things um, in, in just a few minutes. Um, I got my hand back from mental practice, and we'll talk a little bit about that. I don't want anyone to discount that because it actually works, and I'll give some examples of that. Um, there are other, you know, traditional ways that you can get your hand moving again with the therapist. Um, I'm going to cover some of them today. Another one that I'm not going to do a whole lot about because I'm not an expert on it. And I don't believe in talking about things that I don't really know about, and that would be eSTEM. I, I do know enough about it to give an overview to someone um, watching this um, and direct them in, in the right direction. I also know that uh, where you place the pads is the absolute most important thing in doing eSTEM and I've got a resource for everyone on pad placement that everyone who does eSTEM tells me is, is the best. So um, one of the things that you can do that's real simple um, is you can squeeze a towel or a ball. And this uh, is one way to get your hand going. I, I, I know I have a friend, Bob Anderson, who got his hand going off of listening to me and mental practice. I'm taking no credit for that, but I'm trying to reinforce mental practice because like everyone else, I thought it was kind of a crazy idea when I heard about it. Anyway, it worked for Bob, and one of the first things he did was squeeze a towel. It's very simple. It's a very simple motion. You can do it in your lap or on the table and kind of get your hand moving. Another thing they recommend is squeezing a towel or a ball because it puts your hand, you know, your hand doesn't live like this. You don't walk around with your hands like fully extended. There's a kind of a natural position that your hand falls into. And that's kind of what I'm demonstrating here. Uh, your fingers are slightly bent. And so like a, a Nerf ball or a towel kind of puts you in, in that um, position. And guess what? Those are simple splinting solutions. Um, there are splints that are out there that are made. I just realized I don't think I have pictures of them, but I will um, talk to them when I uh, see something else that reminds me about them. You can buy a splint for your hand. Maybe I'll just cover a little bit of it right now. You can buy a splint for your hand that holds your hand open. 
And this is a, generally a good idea. However, you don't want to wear that splint 24 hours a day. Well, first thing is you will not be able to wear a splint 24 hours a day. They typically bother people after a few hours. And what most occupational therapists will have you do is they'll have you wear it in the daytime in the beginning until you can wear it four, five, six hours without it wanting to feel like you have to take it off. And then what they have you do is wear it at night and hold that um, hand open at night and not wear it in the daytime once you can stand it at, at night. So um, a towel or a ball is a form of simple splinting. And there are also a number of uh, simple splinting solutions out there. They range from $20 to $300. They're in a whole lot of difference, in my opinion, um, between the cheaper ones and the more expensive ones. Um, so go ahead and do the next slide there, Samantha. Um, so these are just a couple of oddball things. Um, I didn't, I wanted to cover them, wasn't quite sure where to put them, so here they are and we're going to go over them. One of the things that um, I first found out about through anecdotal um, evidence, talking to other stroke survivors who experienced this, was that oftentimes first thing in the morning, and this is before you get out of bed, accent on the word before, because once you stand up, your brain engages over 200 muscles to take the first step. So even if you walk to the bathroom and back and get back in bed, it's not the same. Of course, the big challenge is lots of us sleep all night. And when we wake up in the morning, we want to walk to the bathroom uh, first thing. So, but one thing that happens is your brain does a sort of a reset. Um, it's not like a total reset. It's not like you wake up, not you didn't have a stroke, but your brain clears out everything in the morning. And there are a lot of people who find that they can get movement in the first thing in the morning before they get out of bed um, that they can't get the rest of the day. So I would suggest that um, as long as you can stand it to stay in bed without having to get up to go to the bathroom, that you, you know, try and work that hand. Um, this actually works with other parts of the body. I had a guy who couldn't raise his toes and, uh, uh, to do a toe lift, and he could move his foot when he was laying in bed in the morning. Um, so that's a, a, a little trick. I also um, have verified this with at least one occupational therapist. Um, we're back to the grip the towel. It's real simple. You can do it on your lap or a table. Um, a lot of times you might want to do things like open your fingers on a table um, because you don't have to support the shoulder that way. And you're, it's kind of a form of blocking or isolating the muscles that you want to work. There's no harm in spreading your fingers with your other hand. Um, you can take and spread your fingers and try and hold them flat if they want to curl back up you can push them back down again and it's it's like anything if you don't go doing crazy things there isn't really anything that you can do wrong all most i was going to say all movements good and i can't think of an example where it isn't but maybe i don't want to say that because maybe there's an example where it isn't good but i found Almost any kind of movement that you do um, um, is good. Um, in fact, later on, we'll talk about one of my concepts, which is work what works. If you got a part of your body that's working, work it. Movement's good. Um, another one that sounded really crazy to me because in the winter, the cold weather makes my um, walking more difficult. Um, due to increased tone or spasticity is always the reason I believed it. So when I heard like uh, a stroke survivor I know uh, said he dipped his hand in ice water for 10 or 15 minutes. So first of all, I don't know, not everybody's hand is the same. I don't think I can dip my affected hand in ice water for 10 seconds, let alone 10 minutes, but um, it does work. 
It does, uh, the cold does reduce spasticity in a hand at least. I'm not sure I understand this, but I verified it with uh, an occupational therapist who actually brought it up in her presentation um, that we had one Tuesday in my stroke groups. Uh, so um, I try and only pass on good information. Um, I try and always when I uh, have a question about something, I try and verify it with an or discredit it with an expert so that I'm not passing on what I'm calling anecdotal stuff that I hear from other people. Um, well, before I've, I've uh, verified something, I will say I heard from from another survivor. After I verified it, I'll make it a statement or say I have verified this with an occupational therapist. Anyway, the point of all this is that um, I'm trying to help stroke survivors, so if you're trying to help people, one of the most important things to do is give them good information. So go on to the next one. Okay, <clears throat> like I did um, with the shoulder, a lot of people like the fact that there were um, resources um, that they, they could um, look for. Uh, so I just, uh, I did a search on opening your hand and uh, and I clicked on videos, so I'd get videos, and I mean, this is what I got. This is the first aid I got. So we got Flint Rehab, then we got Sabo, then we got Dr. Tara Tobias, we got Sabo again, we got a hospital system, um, we got another hospital system, we have a third hospital system, and then we have our friend and stroke buddy, who's not a stroke survivor, but quite a good occupational therapist and she helps out lots of stroke survivors and all the Facebook groups. So bless your heart, at least new one uh, for what you do. Um, go on to the next one. I guess I have a repeat because I was just trying to show that there's um, all kinds of different things. This happens to be Flint Rehab again. Um, but. You, as you can see, they have articles there where you can click and read an article. Not everybody likes to watch videos. I'm a video guy, and I don't really understand this. Well, I do understand it. I have, I did a presentation with one woman who did an hour and a half Zoom call with me, but she can't watch a Zoom call. Um, some people don't like watching videos or don't have the attention span post-stroke. I'm not sure what it is. Everybody learns differently. I'm a visual learner, so I like I like to see somebody demonstrate something to me or watch a video. If I can see it, I can do it. Um, but not everybody's like that. And some people want to be able to read. Some people have hearing issues. Uh, uh, YouTube subtitles stuff, I believe. But even in my group, we're doing transcripts of all of the videos because you can actually read a uh, an hour-long video in less than 15 minutes, so it's quicker. Anyway, so for people who prefer reading articles, there are plenty of articles out there. For people who prefer videos, there are plenty of videos out there. So go on to the next one. Dr. Tara Tobias is exceptional on um, everything uh, having to do with walking because she uh, is a neuro-trained physical therapist. She has a little bit on hands. I don't think hands are her specialty. Typically, the I mean, that's the distinction between a physical and an occupational therapist. And of course, there are different kinds of occupational therapists. Some deal with workplace and getting people back to work and that kind of thing. Other people deal with adaptive techniques if you have permanently lost stuff. Um, there to be avoided if you had a stroke and you want to get your hand back. They start talking about teaching you how to button your shirt one-handed or use uh, clothes pins and things to put things on at various adaptive techniques and you want to get your hand back, I would suggest you speak up at that point because that's a turning point. Basically, um, they'll sometimes say to you, I'm not sure we can do anything with your hand, but a lot of times they'll just make that turn on you and I think the time to stop it is to nip it in the bud. If they're not real receptive and you're at a big enough place, you can ask for another physical therapist. 
Um, it's not big enough place, but your town is big enough. You can go to another place. A lot of stroke survivors don't seem to think that they can have any choice in their therapists, uh, whereas they do. Part of that's because the whole insurance company controls everything. So we think we're kind of at the bottom of the totem pole there. And we kind of are, except we're paying the insurance company. So if you're not happy with your therapist and you want to go someplace else, the place that they work is going to lose your business. So they might very well listen to you. I shouldn't have got off so much on, on that. But anyway, Dr. Tobias is great for walking. She has a little bit on hands. Uh, go ahead to the next one. Oh, we have our friends Bob and Brad. I'll keep my mouth shut about Bob and Brad. I just grabbed this uh, because I wanted to talk a little bit about mirror therapy, which is one. This is a video that they're going to do. <clears throat> it's a screen grab from a video that they're going to do on mirror therapy. <clears throat> mirror therapy is an interesting technique. Basically, you um, put a mirror in front of yourself and you do things with your... Um, with your uh, teaching hand instead of your learning hand, your unaffected hand, and you basically are using the mirror to fool your brain into thinking that your unaffected side is working. That's basically an overview of it. Um, I think it would be more effective. It's kind of like a lot of things. I don't think you in the groups the uh, stroke survivors stroke survivors will report uh, many of them will report it didn't work for me and a few people said it worked great for me and there are a few people over the years who've said things like it worked great for me but it really takes a lot of time and in my looking into it this is not something that works overnight. It's one of those things that you really have to put in a lot of time with. It's like hyperbaric oxygen therapy, HBOT, is another one where people say it didn't work for me. But probably they ran out of money before it started working because HBOT's expensive. Mirror therapy isn't. But I don't think that every stroke survivor out there has the consistency um, to do what's necessary to make mirror therapy work for you. Because if you, you, you really have to be committed to it um, and stick with it for it to work. And then we have, we couldn't leave out Sabo because they have one of the gloves and uh, and they sell splints and things. Their, their stuff is good. It does tend to be on the high end. I grabbed this particular picture because look what she's got in her other hand that she's getting ready to load up on her. Well, she's... A, uh, not um, a stroke survivor herself, but she's getting ready to load that up on her right uh, affected sabo hand there. And that's a dish towel I was talking about. And look, you can see how her hand in grabbing it is in that exact kind of neutral uh, position. Open, but not, you know, not fingers extended. Um, so I put that one in there for that reason. Go ahead, go on. And then Again, if you don't like videos, there's lots of other ways to um, learn the various things that you can do with your hand. I just grabbed a couple, you know, um, it's quite common to see this. I've seen various versions of this um, putty chart showing you. I've got one that shows you about a dozen things you can do with putty. There are quite a few things you can do with putty. I'm not a big fan of squeezing putty forever. But we'll get to that in just a minute. And then uh, there's some pictographs on the right. Basically, if pe people like to rather see pictures. Then there's all kinds of resources out there. So don't think, I'm getting ready to go over some of mine. So don't think like, you know, that my YouTube channel or what I'm, I'm saying is the only thing out there. There's tons of information out there. Gosh, I wish it was out there. When I had my stroke, because I actually, I had a YouTube channel because I'm a YouTube, I mean, because I'm a video professional, so I had it to get jobs and work. Um, and I searched YouTube 14, almost 14 years ago, and there was not a single video on stroke recovery. Not a one. Not one. So there's just tons of resources out there. You have to do... Um, 
a little bit of homework or due diligence on it to make sure that the ones that you're looking at are good. That's one of the reasons I picked, you know, Tara Tobias and Bob and Brad and Flint and Sabo and uh, some of the various uh, ones that I mentioned. Um, because they mostly are pretty good. Sabo and Flint basically make products that help with the hand. So they provide a lot of information and it's all good information in both cases. I use a lot of their links in, in when I help people answer questions. They're doing that because what they're trying to do is provide you with good information so that you think well about them and would consider using their products. In a minute, when we get to the pad uh, placement site, that's exactly what they do. They sell pads. They provide you with good information. They make good pads. If you keep going back to their site and, there's, and their pad placement works for you, guess what you're going to do when you need new pads? Well, you might order from where you were, but you just might switch over. So that's why some of the companies that make some of these products actually do provide really pretty good information because they're trying to get you to be on their side or look at them positively. So go ahead and next. Okay, so mostly I talked twice about Axel Guard. I don't, you know, promote, I don't make anything from mentioning Tara Tobias or Axel Guard or Flint or Sabo or anything. I'm just trying to steer people towards um, what I've discovered to be um, good resources. And this particular company has been um, recommended, uh, I've seen it recommended at least half a dozen times by half a dozen different people. And at least two of them I consider pretty good with these stem uh, because they use it on themselves and they're what I call pay it forward posters or people that try and help other people. So when I see several people like that, and then I looked at this at this list, somebody said I was referring, and they said something like, oh, well, I've got a wrist issue. They'll, they won't deal with that. And I looked down here, and bingo, they had a, they had a thing. I forget exactly what it was, extension. It was getting wrist and finger extension at the same time. We're going to talk about that because that's a big issue. It's hard to open your fingers and bend your wrist. I should be doing this in my affected hand because that other one works fine. This one works fine too. But it's hard to open your fingers all the way and bend your wrist at the same time because all the both the wrists and finger flexors travel through the same place, go down the same area, and end up uh, attaching right here. If you move your fingers, you can watch your forearm move from just above your elbow joint. I can feel it. I can feel those tendons, the other end of those tendons. Anyway, so these folks have got, what, 41, even feet. So they've got a wide range of uh, pad placement, um, E-STEM. So I'm supposed to talk a little bit about E-STEM. This confuses me because there are two different units. There are like um, E-STEM units, and then there are TENS units. TENS is typically T-E-N-S. Oh, I should know what it stands for. I do, but I'm not going to embarrass myself and get it wrong. Um, typically, they're used for pain, and they have different voltage than E-STEM. And if you really want to get pure about it, a lot of the E-STEM machines you can't buy um, without, like, your therapist um, writing you an order for it or, or something. Anyhow, and now some of them are starting to be sold. Five years ago or so, I, it didn't seem like you even buy an E-STEM machine. And people use TENS machines for E-STEM somewhat successfully. This is partially why I'm not going to talk about this, because I didn't use it in my own recovery, and or no one used it on me. And so I don't know. And there's a lot of um, what I consider confusing information on it. Anyway, um, it does work. Uh, basically, the concept is, and why pad placement is so important, is if you've got like a nerve or something here that triggers something, you can put the pads in the right place to trigger that, and then it'll fire an electrical signal, and every time you fire that electrical signal, it'll make a corresponding uh, movement based on the pad placement. 
So it is one way, one way and a good way and a well used way to get your hand moving. And the whole point of this presentation or anything but the hand is that it's important to get it moving. When you get something moving, you can generally build on it. I'm going to tell you this in a minute, but they had me stare at my hand for the um, mental practice uh, thing. And I finally got like an eighth of an inch movement. And I showed them at occupational therapy and they got all excited. And I didn't. I, I thought, okay, you know, a week of staring at my hand, this is what I get. But they said, no, that's great. And, uh, and that was when I was first introduced to the concept. And it's a valid concept that once you get some movement, what that means is even though it was moving an eighth of an inch, my brain was telling it what to, to move an eighth of an inch. The week before that, when I was staring at it and it wouldn't move, there was no connection. And I could repeatedly move it an eighth of an inch. I couldn't move it any more than that, but I could do it three or four or five times. So it was what I would call a controlled movement as opposed to a random movement or some things like, uh, yawning and raising your arm up there are reflex and um, you can't really harness it. I tried to harness that thing because I'd raise my hand all the way up and it'd come all the way back down. And I couldn't raise my hand out of my lap and it just drove me crazy that I couldn't like, you know, repeat it partially and then repeat it a little less and use it until it, until it happened again. But I couldn't find anybody to harness it. And I've asked the question amongst a number of stroke survivors when they bring up the whole yawning reflex thing, and nobody has been able to harness it. One guy said he was. I asked him how, and his, expo uh, his explanation didn't make any sense to me. Anyway, so go on to the next one, and we'll quickly go over this. This is just, I've got a series of 12 videos on the hand. Are they in the perfect order? I don't know, because I was looking and thinking rubber bands needs to come before bolts or whatever. But again, you work what works. When you're ready to do something, you do it. It doesn't matter the order here. If you can't do something, you work on it, or you, you can w drop back and uh, a video or two and, uh, and then come back and, and see if you can get it done. So we're going to go quickly through the 12 of these just because they, you, no, you can go ahead and go ahead. That was right. So I talked a little bit about mental practice. Um, you know, I literally, I thought they were crazy. Um, yeah, stare at your hand and think about moving it and it'll, it's going to move. Well, you know, after a couple of days of that, you really start to wonder, kind of, I kind of felt like an idiot staring at my hand and not moving, but it finally did move a little bit. And I'm here to tell you, we've had two or three people this year who come out and said so. Bob Anderson, uh, one of my stroke buddies, and well, gee, I wouldn't say I coach him. I help him where I can, talk to him on the phone, and interact with him, but he's picked up the ball and run with it as well as I ever did in my recovery, he's ahead of me on some things, not that it's a competition, but um, he got the same little teeny, he got a, actually only one finger, all mine moved about an eighth of an inch, he got one finger one night, and it just started building from there. So there is a, a once you get it moving, you, you, you can typically build on it. I've not heard of anybody getting some movement who didn't continue to get more and more movement. So how would you continue to get more and more movement? Well, one thing is you can open your hand with your unaffected hand. You can go through the range of motion with your whole, you know, moving it with your unaffected hand. So until you can, you know, try it on its own. Now, the one thing, whenever you want to, whenever you move something with, whenever you move a body part that's not working under controlled movement where you you can't control it with your brain and make it move on its own whenever you're doing it with your other hand you want to think about it you want to still engage your brain in mental practice because what you want to do is you want to somehow for it to make that little jump that it did when I was staring at it and it suddenly moved an eighth of an inch so and what you'll see is 
you know, as you open it more and more and you think about opening it, okay, I'm opening it, okay, closing, it'll generally close on their own. They like to, hands like to close better than they like to open. That's because the extensor muscles, the ones that open your hand, are nine times stronger. The ones that close your hand, I mean, are nine times stronger. Your flexors are nine times stronger than your extensors which open your hand. So, I mean, because normally we grip things and, and we, you know, we don't walk around with our hands fully extended. It's, you know, back to a neutral position so you can close it again to, you know, pick up a glass and have a drink or something. So, um, what you want to do is every time you're opening your hand, uh, with your other hand, think about it. I'm opening, 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 opening. And then you can even start, because it'll close easier, you can start, try start closing on its own. Then open, open, open with my brain and close it. Um, I'm closing my eyes, I tend to do that sometimes. One of the things I've found is there are times where you need uh, visual input and there are times where visual, and I'm not saying this is one of them, and there are times where visual input almost gets in the way. So if there's no safety involved, like opening and closing your hand, closing your eyes doesn't do anything, except it might allow you to think about, think about opening it and not be thinking about what you're seeing in front of you. Okay, so next. So these are just all things that I did at home. I don't know what the, if there's an official name for thumb push-ups. Somebody showed them to me. I was in rehab still, so it had to be a therapist or a nurse or, or somebody. This is basically, since it's not a video, you can't see. Basically, what you're trying to do is uh, move your thumb up and down, and then it also combines it with coming over here. So you go up and down and over here and back and up and, and do these endlessly. The reason you want to get this thumb moving that way is a lot of people will um, uh, have a problem. In fact, I have a friend who has this as a permanent issue. So his hand uh, lives like this. And he can raise his thumb, but when he does, his fingers come in. And so, you know, he can raise his thumb all, all he wants with his other hand, but when he does, his fingers will come in. Uh, it's probably a, a flexor and tendon issue again, because getting everything working at the same time is, is tough. Everything runs through your carpal tunnel here. Your wrist is really a crowded space. And like I said earlier, all these things for your fingers and wrists run on the outside down here. So it's, it's difficult to get everything going at once. And this is a, th this thumb exercise is a good way to, to get to where your fingers is like mine is there. That's the reason I grabbed that still frame because that's what you want to be able to do. Ultimately, you don't want your fingers curling in if your thumb's up. You don't want your thumb down if your fingers are out. You want to be able to do both. Um, also, when you, if you, let's see, this side works better because this hand, I have to do it backwards for you to see the inside. So if I'm doing those thumb push-ups, up, down, over here, up, down, over here, when you do this over here motion, that's something that helps you with opposition, which is the next one. That's touching each one of your fingers one at a time. This is really good for a lot of things because what you want to be able to do is move those fingers. Well, I should do that with my other hand, with my affected hand, because I can do that. You want to be able to move those fingers one at a time. My pinky's tough because the pinky and the ring finger share a tendon. So if your pinky and, and ring finger are misbehaving on you, they're the hardest ones. It's nothing wrong with you. Um, they, they, some people can't actually um, do certain things um, because of that shared tendon. So these thumb push-ups help with that opposition process. When I do opposition, I always go one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Get one, two, three, four. What I'm doing is, because otherwise, if you go one, two, three, four, two, three, four, 
Well, I lost track, but if you, if, you, if you don't do each one at each end double, you're doing the ones in the middle double and the ones on the end only one time. So it's one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Um, so that you don't skip. Go ahead to the next one. This is where it gets uh, squirrely as to what's the order here. Because um, one of the things like, okay, the piggy bank, you have to be able to pinch. Okay, so the chip clip one where you learn how to pinch is after it. But I sometimes, I was working on picking up pennies and pinching with a chip clip kind of at the same time. That's why I'm saying there's no real order here. And if you can pick up coins in the, ch in the chip clip twists out of your hand like uh, they will. Chip clips are better than clothespins. Clothespins are fairly narrow. So when you squeeze them, they have a uh, they have a tendency to roll. That's one reason I switched to a chip clip. Also, um, 14 years ago, <coughs> clothespins were more common than they are now. Try and find clothespins these days; they were hard enough 14 years ago. And chip clips have taken over the world in the last 20 years. And they don't flip; they're wider, so they're better. But again. You know, in, in any of these or anything you find on, online on somebody else's channel or anything, um, work what works. If, if you can do something, do it. It doesn't matter if you learn to pinch off of picking up coins or if you or if you learn to do it off of a chip clip. And like I said, I think I was working on both. It's kind of hard because I've recreated, in a sense, with my YouTube channel. I recreated in my recovery, since YouTube channel is five years old, almost 14 years out. So I recreated my recovery nine years after it happened. So I don't, you know, have recollections of exactly what I did. I didn't write down like, um, okay, I'm working with a chip clip and the coins at the same time. Um, there are a couple in here that I learned after my recovery that I threw back in. Anyway, the point is, um, work what works. One of the things, and it's in my putty video, one of the things you have to be careful about is that I've actually heard people say that they squeezed putty for three years and they got their hand back. Um, don't know how because you can't open. It's not teaching you to open your hand. And <clears throat> I've confirmed this with four occupational therapists, not one, not two, not three, but four uh, different occupational therapists. And they all will tell you that once you can grip and hold on to things, that it's best for you to work on extension or opening. Now, when I sometimes when I write that people say, so I shouldn't grip anything anymore. No, of course, you have to grip something, you know, try and grip it. Try and grip something like a glass with your affected hand and drink of it. Bold move, Ray Ralph, because I'm not very good at that. Anyway, um, there's certainly things that you're going to have to grip. If you go get the mail, well, I learned to grip one of the, by going and get the mail. I would go get the mail every day and I would hold the mail um, like this. Like, obviously, you can hold it like this and it can't fall through your hand, but I would hold it, um, hold the mail and hold my hand by my side like I would do with my other hand. Whenever you don't know what to do with your affected side, just look over at your teaching side. Teaching side knows what to do to teach the healing side. Thank you, Leslie Hadley, for that language. I stole it from her. I love the teaching hand or the teaching side and the healing side. But the teaching side always knows what to do. So, you know, if you're carrying the mail back, stick it in your other hand, don't think about it, and start walking. Then look down and see. And what will be happening is your hand will be carrying it like that. And I guess what? I dropped a mail about one out of every three days for the first month or so. But that was the point. Because you have to learn how to, you don't want to death grip something. Because that causes a lot of tension and can cause spasticity. So you have to learn, one of the things that's difficult about the hand is learning how much, how hard to grip. To, you know, not death grip. But you also have to hold that mail strong enough that it doesn't fall out on you every three, every three days like it did to me. So I just practiced it over and over again. And, and pretty soon, there was no problem getting the mail. So I didn't worry about making sure I got it every day. 
Um, so once you can squeeze pretty good, I say work on extension. I also like the grippers more than putty. They have spring grippers where you pull something in and there's, you're working in springs. Well, guess what happens? As soon as you relax, it pulls your hand back out. Putty, if you bury your fingers in the putty, I've actually buried my fingers in the putty where I, I couldn't open my hand again. So on the other hand, putty is great for making loops and working on extension. There's all kinds of things like you saw some in that chart that you can do with putty. I just don't think that squeezing putty and doing nothing else for three years is a very smart strategy to get in your hand back and several occupational therapists have agreed with me. The one thing I like about the piggy bank is, guess what? That's a potato salad container I got from free when I bought a pound of potato salad. I just cut a notch in it, and that's scrap, you know, scrap. That's a spare change, uh, you know, from your uh, dresser bucket where you throw your spare change in every day and save it up for vacations or whatever you do with yours. That's what I do with mine. I throw it into a big old fishbowl for a couple of years, and then when I go on vacation, I got two or three hundred dollars extra. Anyway, so it's a real good exercise for that. And again, everything that I do, I try and do with things that are easy, like a free potato salad container and 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 coins, because um, this makes it easy and repeatable. Uh, you don't have to have um, a lot of expensive devices or anything to get better. You have to have a mindset to get better, and you have to put in your time. And the more focused you are in the quality of the exercises you do, as well as the quantity of exercises that you do, the I think the faster you're going to recover. So go ahead, next. And here we got, okay, the rubber bands maybe should be, we haven't even got to the chip clip, because you got about four or five now that, you you know, once you get that hand moving, you got several things you can do. Do you have to do bolts? No, you don't have to do bolts. They're just really, you know, you can skip any of these. These are just all things that, that work. One of the things about bolts is you can learn to do that twisting motion again. And that one takes a little bit of time. And bolts are really good for that. And, you know, those bolts I bought for a little, I think I spent about $1.50 on two or three bolts and nuts and washers. And I like the nuts and washers because once you get good at that twisting motion, one of the things that you want to do is twist it all the way off. Because guess what? When you put a cap on a on back on the olive oil or uh, the salt or something or you put a nut onto a bolt it has to be lined up pretty much perfectly in order to grab that first thread and screw because if it's a little bit wonky it, it won't work so it's really good for and in that video of course i go about putting the washer and bolt on I and mean, the washer and nut onto the bolt don't stab the um, some people stab the uh, washer with their good hand. Well, the whole point is you want to like slide it, learn how to slide it on, hold it in place, don't shake it, slide it right on with the affected hand. Uh, work what doesn't work. Rubber bands are kind of outdated. I went and got a rubber band for this video uh, for four, four or five years ago because that's what I used. But in the end of it, I, of that particular video, I also have these new things. They basically have made these um, rubber bands. I'm holding my hand in a certain position because, like, that's the position. They make a five-hold rubber band, and it would slide right on my hand as long as I had my fingers like that. If I had them like this, it wouldn't. But if you imagine a, a circle at every one of my fingertips, so there's a big rubber band that will hold all five, and you can work on on um, extension. This is a good extension exercise. The only problem is, as you can see, look at my middle finger there. It's on a big angle and that rubber band is like coming back this way. If you don't hold them right and get and set them just right, they'll slide down your fingers. So those newer devices are better. But the basic concept is using something simple. You can buy one a set of like buy one of those things for four or five dollars but you can buy a set 
of like four and four different strengths. And that would be a good idea. Start with the easiest and then build up, build up, build up. That's what you always want to do. Uh, I did it with shorter rubber bands. I used the long ones in the beginning and I got shorter ones and I got wider ones that were harder. But you can buy a whole set of those um, finger extension things for less than $10 for a set of four. Good investment. Um, go ahead next. Okay, finally we got to the chip clip. We've been uh, pinching ever since we picked up the coins, but a chip clip, or in I, my case, I use clothes pins uh, mostly. I did have a, one chip clip because I got frustrated with the clothes pins rolling. When you're doing this and the clothes pins narrower than your fingers, it's real easy to get a roll. And I don't know if it's everyone's like me but when i don't do something successfully i a number of times over and over again i'm getting frustrated and i don't like to get frustrated because i know it works against recovery so as soon as i'm starting to get frustrated i'll start looking for an, another solution and that's why one day when i was uh, having chips for lunch or something i went oh look here's a chip clip i bet that would work better in a clothespin and it did and i integrated it into my program um, so, and then we got a hammer. This is kind of a wrist thing, but it's important, um, to get your wrists moving with your hand. Uh, and this is going to work pronation and supination of the wrist. Um, again, it's, you know, everybody's got a hammer. In fact, I've got a couple of hammers and one of them's an eight ounce hammer. You can buy an eight ounce hammer at one of your big box stores or order online for about five bucks. A typical hammer is a pound, uh, and starting out, that's a lot. There are two things you can do, and one is instead of having the hammer all the way out there, at the end you can choke up closer to the head so that you don't have as much um, weight swinging out as far. Another thing you can do is get an 8-ounce hammer. Another thing you can do is take a wooden spoon and go through it and somebody I recently said oh, okay but it's too easy I said well strap you know tape something to the wooden spoon if the hammer's too hard so again you know um, don't let something as simple as uh, coming up with a alternative solution stop you from uh, working the part of your body that you want to work so next um, Shuffling cards. There are a lot of things. Now we're starting to move into almost into functional exercises. Um, that's kind of like the therapy is all around you concept. I'm going to touch on that um, in a minute before, right before I finish up. Um, but, you know, shuffling cards is kind of uh, almost like a, well, it's something you, you, you could do, you know, you you could actually be the dealer. You could play cards with your family and be the dealer and you're doing therapy. Uh, it's interesting because when I did this, I hadn't played cards and I hadn't shuffled a deck of cards. Again, I was, I did some in my recovery, but I shot the videos nine years later and I found that, well, I couldn't, uh, I, I was used to pushing the cards out with my left hand and dealing with my right hand because I was uh, right-handed. And so I found when I went to push the cards out with my right, right hand, I couldn't do it very well. When I went back to my left hand, it like worked perfectly. I, I have this feeling, and this can happen to you. I connected with a big chunk of something that I had already known how to do. And in, that, in my recovery, I didn't have to go through all the little teeny steps again like I did with some things. But I literally, I said something on camera. I have it on the video where I said, wow. You know, what, what just happened was I just reconnected with it. I guess because I dealt the cards with my left hand so much when I was doing this, it just, bingo, clicked right in. Anyway, so cards are another thing. There's all kinds of stuff you could do. You could be playing, uh, shaking dice and playing Yahtzee. You could be uh, moving the pieces of a Scrabble game with your affected hand. See, now I'm doing a little out, not what some people might say is out of the box thinking, but therapy's all around you. So it just took one thing, like playing cards, and I thought of two other games that you could play where you could involve that uh, affected hand. 
And pegboards are great because they involve a lot of different things. First of all, you have to be able to pick stuff up. That's pinching. We've already, at this point, you're already pretty good at pinching. But I tell people, people get overwhelmed real easily. So, and I had some, I actually bought three or four of this set and two or three others, two others. I sent three pegboards to four people and had them test them. And then I tested the same ones myself. And I like this one best, and so do most people, for, and for a couple of reasons. And I don't, I'm not selling this one either. It just happens to work. It comes with 100 pegs. And one person went, oh, my God, I looked at those pegs, and I got freaked out. So I tell people, put away, pull out, don't even look at all the pegs. Pull out 20. Pull out five of each color and put the other 80 away for now. And I said, don't try and put them in the hole, because one person tried to put them in the hole, like out of the get-go. And they couldn't, and they got frustrated. Well, what happens when you get frustrated? You stop. Stopping is never good. So I always try and come up with things, you know, if you can't do something, you break it down so you can keep doing it and learning the pieces of it so that you don't get frustrated and stop, and you eventually get to the end goal of putting it all together. So in this video, I tell people, First, just pick them up. Second, pick them up and put them in the middle of your hand and now orient them. No, second, I say pick them up oriented. Then pick them up and learn how to roll them out. And what you got to do is get the part that goes the peg. You got to get the peg sticking out of your hand. If it's sticking back this way, you're not going to stick it in. So once you can orient them and get the peg out, then you're ready to put them in the pegboard. This one uses the old proverbial square holes and round pegs, and they're a little tight. So one thing you can do, um, but the tops of each of these pegs has a round hole. And you can actually, if you line it up, you can take one peg and drop it into another one without any force. I actually show you this in the video. I actually let go and drop it, and it falls in. Whereas when you put it in the pegboard, you have to push. And that motion can do like what... Um, happens to um, a clothespin. It'll, it'll, it, your fingers can twist and you'll kind of lose your grip on the thing. So the point of this isn't about pegboards. The point of this is about sometimes you need to break things down and don't do them all at once. Also, one of the people showed me a video of him doing this after I sent him the thing. And what was he doing? He was picking them up with his good hand and putting them into his affected hand and putting them down that's defeating the whole purpose because you're doing about three quarters of the work with his effect with his unaffected hand so i need to wrap this up here which i can do we're just about at the end so go ahead and flip samantha um so we've talked a little bit about isolating and blocking things stuff like the thumb push-ups um okay i'm gonna do another quick demo it's hard for me to see what i'm doing here um wrong way so one thing you can do and i found that this is a lot easier to do with uh bilaterally so i've got both hands here and i can lift up one finger at a time but if i do both at the same time it's easier there come both the hands and pinkies so one another thing you can do is lift them up and then tap them and i'm doing them randomly uh and i don't have to think about it because i'm doing it with this hand your brain's already made to work um uh, both sides together. So there's lots of opportunities. We talked a little bit about this in hand, in the shoulder and stuff. When you're in the shower, you can do things with your hand, wash your hair the same with both hands. There's uh, lots of chance for bilateral therapy. You can also use it to make isolating and blocking muscles like I was just showing you easier because like I said, when I put both hands down and I just start doing that, it's much more automatic than if I do it with only my affected hand. Uh, okay, we're gonna before we end, we're gonna get there's. It's not really a trick, but there's a wrists and flexors. Like I said, it's difficult to get them all working together. I'll show you that. And then moving fingers separately. There are a number of ways to do that. Oppositions one. The thing I just was showing is another. Uh, you can also just literally just move them one at a time. Um, it's important to get your fingers moving separately because it's they want to move together when you first start getting some movement back. And if you really want to have, you know, fine motor skills, I should be doing that again with my affected hand.
because they both work pretty well. Whoop, wrong way. Um, it's important to get them going um, separately. I could never have learned to roll my hand, affected hand, if I didn't have separate finger control or at least the beginnings of it. So next, and I'll finish up on this. Um, okay, so one. this is showing like wax on, wax off from the last presentation. Well, guess what? My wrist is bent and my fingers are open. And that's r really hard to achieve. So one of the things you can do is you can open those fingers. Everything's backwards and I can't see it. You know, you can um, get those fingers open with your wrist flat on the table. And then if you get them, once you get them open, you can open them with your other fingers. And you can hold them open, push down. If they want to come up, you can push them back down. And once you get them going like that with your wrist um, extended, I mean uh, straight, you can start, you can start to like try and stand up and bend that wrist. It won't happen that fast, like I'm talking about. And in fact, you may actually have to dip your wrists below the table. Your, your wrist, the hand wrist thing, I'm going to demonstrate with this hand just because it's it, it works better on camera. So I don't mean physically, I mean the, the way that it's framed. Um, so basically, your wrists would be bent like this, and your and your fingers are you know either balled up or maybe not all the way. But I mean, this is not an un untypical position for a hand and wrist. And people, when their wrist is bent like that, they can open their fingers. But if they start moving their wrist up, their fingers will close. And in fact, they may not be able to move it up. So even if they move it up with this one, I'm going to manually close my fingers because they don't automatically close they'll close it's really hard to get the fingers open and the wrist all the way back do it with my affected hand so you know it is possible because there's 90 degrees when my affected hand and my fingers are open um, so back to a towel you can do that towel on the table you know for wax on wax off it's not so important that you do that, the movement, except if you move forward and backward on a table and left and right or in circles and everything, you're working more of the hand and arm. And it's real easy to hold on to a, a, a dish rag like that. It's a lot harder to hold on to something smoother. So that's why Sable was using it that's why Bob Anderson f fell into it that's why wax on wax off exists because it's just a real easy thing to start to get a, a grip on so go ahead and flip and, and this is basically just showing this is a weight bearing and eventually what you want to do is get to that right frame I'm uh, where bait weight bearing on my affected um, shoulder only and I got my hands open and my wrist is bent to 90 degrees. So you want to be able to eventually do all that. It won't happen overnight. It will not happen overnight. Something that's a, back to the title of this whole series. It's a progression. There's certain things you have to do to get there. And I hope I'm making um, some of this at least semi-clear as to how you go about that. So. Go ahead, here's Samantha, that's most of it. I was just going to uh, summarize a couple things. Like I've said several times, work what works. If you can't do something, if you, know, you can't do the bolts, don't freak out and think you have to do the bolts. If, you, if you're, if you you know, doing piggy banks and chip clips and things, you're, you know, you're probably getting most of, of what you need. And the thing that you want to do is not get frustrated because all frustration leads to quitting in my opinion well it does with me i know when i get frustrated enough i just don't want to i don't enjoy it i don't want to go there so i don't go ahead next and our favorite phrase therapy is all around you so we'll quickly flip through these samantha and then i'm done um, last time we had um, getting the vitamins out is the same as the therapy comes with PT. Um, well, guess what? Flip to the next one and you'll see 
Uh, you know, you can further, you can take this one step further. When you get all those vitamins down, you can take the tops off with your affected hand, then pour them into your affected hand. Watch out for vitamin D. When I was shooting this video, I dropped about 20 of them. My cameraman said, take two. I said, nope, I'm going to pick them all up on camera and put them back, and I did. Anyway, small things are really hard. That's a good thing to be practicing, isn't it? I tell the, when I work with people, I tell them, I, I look, and I'll watch them do something, and I'll go, you're not very good at that. Do you know what that means? They'll look at me like, oh, no, what's he going to say? And I'll, I say, that means you got a lot of them in your future. And the point of that is if you have trouble with small things like vitamin D, keep doing it. If you keep doing it, eventually you'll get it. So there's a step two to taking these vitamins down. Therapy's all around you. Go ahead and flip. There's lots of good therapy in the kitchen. Putting lids on things. That balsamic vinegar happens to have a spring spout, so it's particularly challenging. I love it. Washing dishes. I return to cooking because I like to cook. And it's, gr it's great therapy. Go ahead, next. And more cooking, more cooking, more cooking. And next. I also... Um, I'm a photographer and I have a little, uh, not print shop, I have a sort of a framing shop. I, I get the frames I want uh, pre-made and then I cut the mats and print the pictures and mat them and, and frame them. It's really good occupational therapy. I discovered it, of course, the hard way because I was doing my prints. Uh, the land trust I work with gave them away for to people as awards and shortly after that fall after my stroke they wanted me to do some prints and I'm going boy I don't know if I could do that but I said oh sure yeah I'll, I'll do that and I set about to do them and I found it took me over I had timed everything I did because I was trying to fig do time and motion studies to figure out how much I should be charging um, I don't charge anymore but uh, I had done those and um, so I knew exactly how long it took me. It took me at least twice as long in the beginning, but now I'm down to 10% longer than it used to take me. I'm not as fast. Certain things are tricky. Double-sided tape, taking 20 inches of double-sided tape and peeling it off and then sticking it down in the right place. That's a little tricky. Anyway, so I, I, I use I. I once said there's nothing better to prepare you for life than life itself. No better therapy to prepare you for life than life itself. And I'll stick by that. So I use uh, life as a lot of uh, therapy. If you watch some of these other ones, you'll, you'll heard me say I do a lot of yard work for physical therapy. Go ahead and flip. I got carried away with the framing. This is one I made for my nephew. And... I actually framed it. I uh, didn't take a picture of it framed in the wood frame. You can see that in the lower left. And I actually built a box because if you go to the store, to like the UPS store, and you have them take a, a print like this and put it in one of their giant boxes, now you're into oversized box charge and foam and the $12 for a dollar cardboard box. And it comes $108 to ship that print. And I said, no way. And I weighed it out, and I built a 11-pound uh, thing, and I shipped it for $24 instead of 108 And I got a lot of really good occupational therapy in the meantime. So um, that's basically it.